For a drug to be approved in the U.S., specifically by the FDA, it must be proven to be safe and effective using adequate and well-controlled investigation. So there are four different types of measurable drug effects, the unanticipated and anticipated harmful effects, and the unanticipated and anticipated beneficial effects. Unanticipated harmful effects are the undesirable effects of drugs that couldn't have been predicted on the basis of their preclinical pharmacologic profile or their mechanism of action or the results of pre-marketing clinical studies. And these effects are most often type B adverse reactions. And for example, chloramphenicol wasn't known to cause aplastic anemia when it was marketed and neither was the skeletal muscle pain that's associated with the use of HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors or the statins. Next, we have the anticipated harmful effects. So these are the unwanted effects of drugs that actually could have been predicted on the basis of preclinical and pre-marketing studies. And these could be type A or type B reactions. And an example is the syncope that occurs after patients take the first dose of prazosin. Even though this effect was known to occur at the time of marketing based on its mechanism of action, how often the event occurred is still uncertain. Unanticipated beneficial effects are the desirable effects of drugs that weren't anticipated at the time of drug marketing. Even though these effects might still be medically useful, they're still considered side effects, even if they're not for the purpose for which the drug was given. An example of this would be aspirin. Patients who were given the drug for its analgesic or anti-inflammatory action were actually found to have a less chance of a subsequent MI, and currently this has been confirmed as a valid new indication for the use of aspirin. Finally, we have the anticipated beneficial effects. These are the desirable effects that are known to be caused by the drug. They represent the reason for prescribing the drug. The study has three aspects. First, we have the drug efficacy, which looks at whether a drug has the ability to bring about the intended effect, and it's usually the effect of the drug in an ideal world with perfect compliance and no interactions with other drugs or other diseases. Second, we have the drug effectiveness, which looks at whether in the real world a drug in fact achieves its desired effect. And finally, the efficiency, which investigates whether a drug can bring about a desired effect at an acceptable cost. Clinical problems with pharmacoepidemiologic research. Pre-marketing randomized clinical trials generally provide information on whether the drug can produce at least one beneficial effect. Patient compliance during these studies is assured. Patients included are similar in age and sex, do not have other diseases, and are not taking other drugs. Such restrictions maximize the ability of pre-marketing studies to demonstrate a drug's efficacy if the drug is actually efficacious. But in the real world, does the drug actually achieve the same beneficial effects? Does it have other beneficial effects? Factors that can modify a drug's ability to achieve its beneficial effects include variations in the drug's regimen, characteristics of the indication for the drug, characteristics of the patients receiving the drug, such as demographic factors, nutritional status, presence of concomitant illnesses, the ingestion of drugs, and so on. Many, if not most, of these factors that can influence the effects of drugs are not fully explored prior to marketing. In order to quantitate the need for post-marketing studies of the beneficial effects of drugs, a comparison was made of the 100 most common drug uses in 1978 to the information available in the FDA. However, it was restricted to drugs approved after 1962. The results are that of the 100 common drug uses, 31 had not been approved by the FDA at the time of initial marketing, and 18 still had not been approved at the time of the comparison, Eight were based on the assumption that a drug had a particular long-term effect, but only an intermediate effect had been studied prior to marketing, and five have been for either the intermediate effect or the long-term effect of the drugs, but only the intermediate effect was studied prior to marketing. For example, hypoglycemic agents may be used to control the symptoms of diabetes or to prevent the vascular complications of diabetes, but only the former was studied prior to drug marketing. Clinical factors that were able to modify the effect of drugs are shown in the following table, but were discovered after drug marketing. For instance, ibuprofen is indicated for rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, but daily dosage initially approved, approved to be suboptimal. Ampicillin, for example, is used for otitis media, but it's no longer the drug of choice in some geographic areas due to bacterial resistance, and so on with other drugs.
Other results were that the proportion of prescriptions which were for patients less than 20 ranged from 0 to 97%. Yet, many of these uses had not been tested in children prior to marketing. Only three of the drugs were approved for use in pregnant patients. Yet, we know that drug use in pregnancy was common even then. In conclusion, this study revealed considerable gaps in the information about beneficial drug effect at the time of drug marketing. The data needed for clinical decisions are frequently different than those needed for regulatory decisions. Studies performed prior to marketing are focused predominantly on meeting appropriate regulatory requirements and only secondarily on providing a basis for optimal therapeutic outcome. Finally, the FDA is not allowed to regulate physicians, but rather pharmaceutical manufacturers. The FDA does not initiate its own studies of drug effects, but rather those submitted to it by manufacturers. It seems that more studies of beneficial drug effects are needed, perhaps as a routine part of post-marketing drug surveillance. Okay, so let's talk a little about the methodologic problems that are to be addressed by pharmacoepidemiologic research. So first things first, what is a confounder? A confounder is any factor that interferes with the results of your study that has a direct effect on the outcome of the study but is independent of the variable. It means that the results of this trial may be somehow biased towards this confounding factor. Studies of unintended drug effects present a specific, a special methodologic problem of confounding by the indication for therapy. To the extent that the indication is related to the outcome variable as well, this indication can function as a confounding variable. So it's when your confound, when your uh, exposure or when the uh, exposure is also the uh, confounder. For example, the use uh, when they used uh, beta blockers for secondary prevention of MI. Okay, they classified the two group into two groups: patients who had an MI and are taking beta blockers for secondary prevention, and those who were taking placebo. And as a result, the study showed that the effects were harmful, despite knowing the fact that beta blockers are not harmful. This has been shown because those patients already suffered from hypertension as well, or angina, or any other problem that necessitated the use of beta blockers. So this means that those are a compelling factor themselves for the appearance of another myocardial infarction. Thus, even the use of the drug that was shown to be beneficial can appear to be harmful. So, confounding by the indication is not a problem if the study is focusing on unexpected adverse effects of the drug. In this situation, the indication for treatment is not usually related to the outcome variable under study. For example, patients who present with a GI bleed that, are, that is associated with NSAIDs use, Okay, so those patients are using the NSAIDs for pain, arthritis, or any other indication that's independent of a GI bleed. However, this doesn't mean that the problem of confounding um, is, does not emerge in such situations, but on the other hand, unfortunately, even those types of studies can have a confounding uh, by the indication. So, Although confounding by indication is a less common problem for studies of side effects, nevertheless, this is a big problem for studies of beneficial uh, effects, of anticipated beneficial effects. We expect here for the indication to be closely related to the outcome variable, unlike the previous case. This problem has been shown sometimes to a certain extent that it can invalidate the non-experimental approaches to studies of beneficial effects of drugs. Okay. Some have even felt the need of doing randomized clinical trials in order to avoid this confounding by indication. However, this brings us back to the problem that is this trial feasible because of logistic reasons, because of ethical issues, or because of artificial medication settings. So, what can we propose as solutions to those problems? So, if we categorize them based on the drug information request, so if we look at comparative studies that are unnecessary, for example, drug effects that are obvious in the individual patient, like for example, in one patient where naloxone was used for a methadone-induced coma reversal, where the patient would be awakened and then he would go back into a coma and then be awakened with naloxone and so on, or the drug effect that's obvious in a series of patients, like patients who are using penicillin for pneumococcal pneumonia. Second research question associated with confounding is, confounding by the indication non-existent, there is no indication. Some questions about beneficial drug effects can be answered using formal non-experimental studies because there is no confounding by the indication. 
If the decision about whether to treat is not based on a formal indication, but on some other factor that may not be related to the outcome variable under study, then there is no opportunity for confounding by the indication. In the past several years, non-experimental study designs have been widely used to evaluate the efficacy of vaccines. Specifically, case control studies have been used to explore the efficacy of pneumococcal vaccine, rubella vaccine, etc. Studies like these should ideally be conducted as randomized clinical trials. However, the relative infrequency of the diseases that the above vaccines are designed to prevent, particularly in populations which are partly vaccinated, make use of this design difficult, although not impossible. So, there are several settings in which confounding by indication may exist, but it can be controlled theoretically. The indication can clearly and sufficiently be measured if it is dichotomous and uh, grad gradation in the indication do not exist. For example, when RHD immune globulin is given to RHD negative mothers who deliver RHD positive newborns to prevent future erythroblastosis fetalis. Or when gradations in the indications are unrelated to the choice of treatment. For example, when penis penicillins are used for endocarditis prophylaxis in patients with congenital aortic stenosis who are undergoing tooth extraction. Uh, or when, uh, which is the third one, when gradations in the uh, indications are unrelated to the expected outcome. For example, when penicillins are used to prevent tertiary syphilis given to patients with an asymptomatic positive serologic test for syphilis. So basically, whether the patient develops tertiary syphilis or does not, the patient will receive penicillin. And fourth, when special clinical settings exist, for example, when anticoagulants are used after a myocardial infarction to prevent death, or when estrogens are given, uh, in case of, uh, in case to prevent the osteoporotic fractures. Speaking of confounders by indication that are controlled theoretically, the indication is sufficiently characterizable. It can be divided into complete characterization of the indication as it relates to the choice of therapy or as it relates to expected outcome, or characterization must continue after initiation of therapy. An example of this would be the study of the efficacy of lidocaine in preventing death from myocardial infarction using a case control design. Among patients admitted to a coronary or intensive care unit for acute myocardial infarction, those who died were compared to an equal number of patients who survived. The controls were matched the cases for age, gender, race, and date of hospitalization. Overall, lidocaine did not protect against death. Lidocaine was effective only when deaths attributable to ventricular arrhythmia were analyzed separately. In this study, the investigators were aware of the risk of confounding by indication. And finally, confounding by the indication exists and is uncontrollable. Confounding by the indication cannot be controlled when question of intended drug effects do not fall into any of the preceding categories. In this case, Non-experimental study designs cannot be used, or they can only be used to dem demonstrate some degree of beneficial effects. As an example, patients treated with corticosteroids for status asthmaticus are expected to be sicker than those not so treated. If patients receiving corticosteroids stop wheezing sooner than those who are not receiving it, corticosteroids would be indeed having a beneficial effect. However, if patients receiving corticosteroids do not stop wheezing sooner than those who are not receiving it, then the results of the study are uninterpretable. All in all, clinical non-experimental research has left a trail of knowledge and usefulness of medical in uh, interventions behind it, knowing that those are only non-experimental, but yet they show validity. As a scientist once said, to keep up with the clinical literature, 
discard at once all articles on therapy that are not randomized trials. So this shows that scientists actually oppose the use of non-experimental studies for the extraction of safety and efficacy. However, there should always be a balance between both types of studies. So many investigators are now basically applying non-experimental designs to studies of beneficial drug effects. However, this doesn't mean that we have to exclude the fact that we have uh, confounding by indication. And this doesn't replace experimental studies. However, it can be used as a beneficial um, alternative whenever an uh, experimental study cannot be performed because of cost, ethical reasons, um, infeasibility, and many others.